Hey everyone, me Kevin here. I took the entire Tesla Battery Day event and cut it down to the highlights. Here you go. And if you like my work, make sure to check out the links down below for a free stock with Webull, life insurance you can get in as little as five minutes, and of course my awesome programs on making money through investing in real estate and stocks. Enjoy. We got the, the Tesla drive-in movie theater, basically. Um, it's good to see everyone. It's a little hard to read the room, and we'll see the, the Shanghai factory continue to scale uh, quite a bit from where it is right now. I think we, we really could expect that to be over time, a factory that produces over a million vehicles a year. You know, I think the, the, the value of Tesla is going to be like total, just on the vehicle side, total vehicles produced times the value of autonomy. That's, that's a, a way to think about the future value of Tesla. And I think we'll do r really pretty well in 2020, um, probably somewhere between 30 to 40 percent growth, despite uh, a lot of very difficult circumstances. Um, and you can see it in the, you know, the, the, the safety report that we publish every quarter. Um, it's just getting better and better. Uh, the US average for collisions is um, you know, at roughly 2.1 per million miles. Uh, and with autopilot engaged, it's 0 0.3. Um, I think we'll, we'll hopefully release uh, a private beta of, of autopilot, of the full self-driving version of autopilot in, I think, a month or so. Uh, and then people will, will really uh, understand just the magnitude of the change. It's, it's profound. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. Um, and so when we put it all together and go to our new 80 millimeter length, 4680 we call this uh, new cell design, we get five times the energy with six times the power and enable 16% range increase just form factor alone. Just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction. Just that cell form factor change. It's, it's close to working, <laughs> but it's not, even now it, at the pilot plant level, it is close to working. Well, I, I can't, I, it's fair to say it probably, it does work, but with not a good, not a high yield. Yeah, So we're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. I mean, we are on the fourth generation of the equipment, so we've learned a lot along the, along the way. Yeah. I mean, it is super demanding because every atom has its place if you want to deliver the energy density and the cycle life and the supercharging. Yeah. But we're, but we're, we're confident that we will get there, but it yeah. will be a lot of work along the way. There's a clear path to success, but a ton of work between here and there. Yep. So, uh, but this is a, a really profound improvement. Again, for people that know battery uh, manufacturing, this is, a, this is gigantic. The key to... A high-performing assembly line is accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. Exactly, no st stop lights and traffic lights or anything. You want the highway. I want the highway. Yeah. And we were able to get to the point where we can uh, implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours seven times increase in output per line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be seven X the capability is just effort multiplying. Yeah. You would be astounded at how bad most factories are. They're like maybe two or three percent, including our factory in Fremont. Um, so I, I think it, it is possible to get to at least uh, 10 times that of uh, volumetric efficiency. Uh, so more like you know 30 percent uh, ish, maybe more. Um, and be 10x better, it, it, which means the factory can be 10 times smaller. Um, and then the other thing is how fast are things going through, through the factory? It's like speed and density. Um, the, the, fa the faster you go, like if a factory that's moving at say twice the speed of another factory is equivalent to two, two factories, basically. And the, the company that will be successful uh, is the co company that with one factory can accomplish what other companies take two or three or four factories to do. So. This is what we're trying to do here is, is say, okay, how do we, uh, with, with, a, with one factory, achieve what maybe five or even ten factories would normally be required to achieve? What this translates to, based on what we know today, is about a 75% reduction uh, in the investment per kilowatt hour uh, or gigawatt hour. It's, it's just uh, basically four times better than the current state of the art to the best of our knowledge. Uh, and uh, I think there's probably room to improve even beyond that. Definitely. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> we're we're uh, expecting to make on the order of uh, 3,000 gigawatt hours or, or 3 terawatt hours per year. Um, I think we can 
we, we, I think we've got a good chance of, of achieving this actually before 2030, but I, I'm highly confident that we could do it by, by 2030. When you look at the size of that factory on the previous page, it really shows how enabling all of these advancements are in achieving a three terawatt hour goal by 2030. It's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> you know, it's a small world journey of uh, I am a nickel atom. What happens to me? And it's like, it's crazy. Like you're going around the world three times. It's, there's like the moral equivalent of like digging the ditch, filling the ditch, and digging the ditch again. <laughs> uh, it's total madness, basically. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said, how can we make this as simple as possible? And that's what we're proposing here with our process. As you can see, a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate, metal water, final pro product cathode, recirculate the water, no waste water at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's to 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76 reduction in process cost, and zero wastewater. Much more scalable solution. Yeah. We, we actually got uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada. Over um, 10,000 acres. Over 10,000 acres. Um, and then the, the nature of the mining is actually, I think, also very environmentally uh, sensitive in that we, we, we sort of take a chunk of dirt out of the ground, or remove the lithium, and then put the chunk of dirt back where it was. So it will look pretty much the same as before. Uh, and it will not look like terrible. And yeah, it will be nice. <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> so. Simply mix clay with salt, put it in water, salt comes out with the lithium, done. I yeah, mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. 33% um, reduction in lithium cost. 100% electric facility co-located with the cathode plant. So uh, we're really excited about this, and, and there really is enough lithium in Nevada alone to electrify the entire U.S. fleet. Yeah, I think that's true. Actually, just what's in Nevada. That's, uh, that's basically so much damn lithium on Earth, it's crazy. <laughs> we are starting our pilot full-scale recycling production uh, at Gigafactory Reno next quarter to, to continue to develop this process as, as our recycling returns grow. Yeah, I mean, to date it's been done by third parties, but uh, we think we can, we can recycle the, the batteries more effectively, especially since, uh, you know, we, we know our batteries, we're making the same battery as the thing we're recycling. So, uh, whereas like third party recyclers have to consider batteries of all kinds. Uh, what we call it the structural battery, where the battery for the first time will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. This, this is absolutely the way things are done. In, in the early days of, of aircraft, they would carry the fuel tanks as cargo. So the, the fuel tanks um, actually had, were quite difficult to, to carry. They were like basically worse than cargo. You had to, had to kind of bolt them down. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, and then somebody said, hey, what if we just make the wing tanks, what, what if we just make the fuel tank in wing shape? So uh, all modern airplanes, the fuel tank, your, your wing is just a, a, a fuel tank in wing shape. This is absolutely the way to do it. Um, and then the, the, the fuel tank serves as dual structure. Um, and it's, not, it's no longer cargo. It's, it's fundamental to the structure of the aircraft. This was a major breakthrough. Um, we're doing the same for cars. It also allows us to pack the cells more densely because we do not have uh, intermediate structure in the battery pack. So instead of having these, like, uh, supports and stabilizers and stringers and structural elements in the battery. We now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. Basically a, a, a honeycomb sandwich with, with two uh, face sheets. Uh, this is actually even better than what aircraft do because aircraft do not do this. Um, they, they can't do this because fuel is liquid. So <laughs> in our case, the batteries are solid. So we can actually use the, sh the, the steel shell case of the battery to transfer uh, sh uh, shear from the upper and lower face sheet which makes for an incredibly stiff structure, even stiffer than a regular car. So if you can uh, bring things closer to the center, you reduce the polar moment of inertia, and that means you can, you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. You don't want to know why, but it just, it just feels more agile. So it, it's, it's really cool. This is really major. Um, like I said, it's a, so 10% mass reduction in, in the body of the car, 14% range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. I mean, I, I really think that, that long-term, and any cars that do not uh, take this architecture will not be competitive. Range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% increase in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. 56% uh, reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level, and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, which is the true enabler 
when we talk back about how do we achieve this scale problem here? Yeah, so what, what this uh, enables uh, us to do is achieve a new trajectory in the reduction of, of uh, cell cost. And um, now, it, to be clear, it will take us probably a year to 18 months to start realizing these, uh, these advantages. And probably to fully realize the advantages, probably it's about three years or thereabouts. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not like uh, if we could do this instantly, we would. Um, <laughs> But so, uh, you know, what tends to happen as companies get bigger is things tend to slow down. Um, well, actually, they're going to speed up. And they have to speed up if we're going to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Yeah. I mean, long term, we, you know, we want to try to uh, replace about, you know, uh, at least 1% of the total vehicle fleet on Earth, which is about 2 billion vehicles. So long term, we want to try to make about 20 million vehicles a year. Uh, what, does it mean for, what, does this, what does this mean for our future products? Uh, so, uh, we, you know, we're, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling twenty-five thousand dollar electric vehicle. You, you know, this 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 has always been our dream from the beginning of the company. I even like wrote a blog piece about it um, because um, you know our first car was was an expensive sports car, and, and then it was, then it was like slightly less expensive sedan, and then finally it's sort of a I don't know mass market premium, but you know like the Model Three and Model Y. Um, but it really, it was always our goal to try to make an affordable electric car. And um, I think probably, uh, w w yeah, like I said, about, about three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com uh, uh, very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. And when you think about the $25,000 price point, you have to consider how much, in it, how much less expensive it is to own an electric vehicle. Yeah. So yeah. actually, it, it's, it, it becomes even more affordable at that $25,000 price point. Yeah. So we have uh, and extreme performance and range, um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know Model S Plaid. You know what about that? Uh, yeah, anyway, we, we, we took the la latest plat out to Laguna Seca on Sunday. It got um, a minute 30, um, and uh, we think probably there's another three seconds or more to take off that time. Uh, so uh, we're confident the Model S plat will achieve the, uh, the best track time of any production vehicle ever, of any kind, two-door or otherwise. Um, and you can order it now, uh, and it's uh, <laughs> available uh, uh, basically end of next year. Is it going to be possible to get climate control to the back of the Cybertruck? Because that would be the ultimate <laughs> camping machine if we can get all night climate control. Uh, we'll try to do that. Thank yeah. You. I agree. That would be, that'd be really cool. How does the ice industry look like for uh, in the future? Uh, well, I don't think there will be an ice industry long term. Um, well, it's hard to say what the volume exactly would be for the Cybertruck. The, the orders are gigantic, so and we have like I don't know, well over half a million orders. I think maybe six or six hundred thousand. That's a lot, basically. We stopped counting. 